So uh, hello, everyone. I'm Tom Ferry, Executive Director of the Aspen Institute's uh, Sports and Society, Society Program. Welcome to our new building at the Aspen Institute, and welcome to uh, the Future of Sports, our conversation series where we think through some of the biggest questions of our time at the intersection of, uh, of, of sports and society, completely uh, in line with the mission of the Sports and Society Program, which is to convene leaders, facilitate dialogue, facilitate dialogue and inspire solutions that help sports serve the public interest. Thank you. Uh, the first event in the series was hosted in January. It was on the future of football, where we asked the question of what if flag football was the standard way of playing football up until uh, the high school level? Had a, had a number of leaders come together from a diversity of perspectives, and, uh, and, and we, we talked that one through. You know, this series is not so much about what uh, should happen, but what would happen? Taking a conversation that's sort of in the bloodstream already and really giving stakeholders, leaders, the opportunity to really think it through. Um, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's really about looking into a crystal ball as best as, we, as best as we can. Today's event is about college sports and comes in the wake of last week's report from the Commission on College Basketball, appointed by the NCAA and chaired by Condoleezza Rice. The commission was convened in the wake of federal bribery and fraud charges. Um, prosecutors allege hundreds of thousands of dollars were used to influence recruits on where to attend college. 10 people have been arrested, including coaches at Arizona, USC, Auburn, and Oklahoma State. Hall of Fame coach Rick Pitino, as you know, lost his job. The commission made several recommendations. Um, including uh, getting rid of the one and done rule in which players are essentially forced to go to college to make their way to the NBA and also stronger penalties for coaches who violate NCAA rules. We're here today to explore the key issue that the commission didn't address, which is the financial value of NCAA athletes. Many observers believe that widespread under the table payoffs occur because athletes simply have more value than the scholarship uh, provides. Meanwhile, the courts will um, be addressing these athlete compensation issues through uh, the, the Kessler case, which is uh, coming up this year. Um, uh, Secretary Rice did say uh, in her in her post report comments that the legal picture, uh, as it becomes uh, more clear, the NCAA should reconsider its treatment of college athletes' name, images, and likenesses, or NIL, a term that you'll hear a lot of today. A full disclosure here, Secretary Rice is a, um, is a trustee of the Aspen Institute. Um, we were not consulted on her report, nor was she consulted in us selecting this program topic or shaping any of its content. We did invite her to participate. As a speaker, she declined, citing a uh, scheduling conflict. The NCAA, we also invited to send a representative. They declined uh, as well. Um, a couple housekeeping items. There are going to be two panels today. Okay, some great conversation, and then you, and there are a lot of smart people in the room here. We want to uh, leave room for Q&A. We'll have the opportunity to, uh, to ask a few questions. Um, the panels are going to be concurrent, so we're not going to take a break. So if you need to get up and go to the bathroom or have a sidebar conversation, feel free to do so. If you can, please be mindful of the cameras in the room. Maybe you could just uh, uh, walk out this door if you're on that side or over there. Make sure you go out, go out that one. Um, it is uh, obviously it's on the record. The uh, the conversation will be archived for future use. Um, and before we get started, I'd like to thank uh, Marilyn and Michael Glosserman, who are in the front front row here, who made this entire conversation series possible. They are the ones who are allowing us to ask these big questions, to go through this act of essentially scenario planning, uh, take these very difficult ideas that are out there but are promising and really think them through. So I want to thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Michael, for, uh, for making this series uh, possible. Um, the, uh, to lead the conversation on what if college athletes were allowed to receive outside income from sponsors, um, I'd like to introduce John Solomon, our editorial director. John, as many of you know, was an award-winning reporter with CBS Sports for many years before that. With, uh, with Alabama.com in Birmingham and uh, knows this topic inside and out. Many of you have great respect for John. I do as well, that's why he's working with our program. So I'd like to bring John up uh, to uh, get us started. Great, thank you, Tom. Uh, very, th thank you all so much for, for being here today. We think it's gonna be a really thoughtful, enlightening discussion 
about reimagining athlete pay in college sports. Let me start real quick with a show of hands. Uh, raise your hand if you think college athletes should be allowed to be paid by their university. Okay, all right. Now raise your hand if you think college athletes should be allowed to be paid from outside sponsors off their own name. Okay, interesting. Now raise your hand if you think the system is just fine as it is and that a scholarship is adequate compensation. Okay, interesting responses. Uh, I ask this because there are different definitions of what pain players actually means. And the lawsuit before the courts right now, the so-called Jeffrey Kessler case, uh, is essentially calls for free agency for players, colleges being able to pay players beyond the value of their scholarship. Where all this goes, nobody quite knows. Uh, but what today we're gonna talk about is a more limited form of compensation, the so-called Olympic model, in which players could receive outside uh, income from other entities. This could mean players being paid for commercials, uh, for autographs, uh, speaking appearances, jersey sales, video games, all sorts of merchandise. To help you understand a little bit about this uh, couple key definitions of terms today, it's important to know what some of these things mean. Uh, the Olympic model you hear a lot about today is athletes making endorsement money from outside sources. You know, for the longest time, the Olympics had uh, very stringent in, uh, amateurism rules that were similar to the NCAA. Uh, if you made money, you couldn't be able to compete in the games. The Olympics evolved over time, uh, and now pro uh, athletes are allowed to compete in the Olympics, and you have a lot of uh, uh, countries even uh, pay medalists uh, bonuses for winning particular games, and the Olympics remain very popular. Another key term to know is name, image, and likeness. You also hear that referred to as NIL. And this is the right of an individual to control the commercial use of his or her identity. Now throughout this conversation, we're gonna have a couple assumptions for what the Olympic model is gonna mean, just to sort of focus it a little bit more. One is that athletes could get group or individual endorsements. In other words, they could get, uh, go out on their own and get endorsement money, or they could pool their rights together, you know, maybe collectively on a team, maybe collectively, collectively on a school, and perhaps even having the university be a, a part of it as well. We're gonna assume that agents and uh, business managers would represent athletes. They would need that for, uh, to understand the legal complexes, com uh, the complex <laughs> issues of, of the legal issues, and they would need to be able to uh, uh, be able to represent them. We're also gonna assume that athletes would pay taxes on outside income, and we're gonna assume that colleges would not be sharing TV dollars with athletes. So why do we talk about the Olympic model? For a couple reasons. One is that uh, public sentiment is changing. If you see here, the Washington Post did a survey in 2017 that showed that 66% of Americans now support college athletes being allowed to earn money through merchandise sales. Also, many people in college sports believe that the Olympic model would be the least disruptive approach if it were adopted. Uh, in other words, theoretically, it wouldn't cost the colleges any amount of money, and it might be able to alleviate uh, any potential concerns with Title IX and women's sports. And also NCA President Mark Emmert recently said uh, that the, the uh, Olympic model deserves serious consideration within the context of college sports. Now there's no doubt that many of the approximately 460,000 NCA athletes already get a pretty good deal right now. Uh, they get a scholarship, they're allowed to uh, have access to a quality education, uh, and they are able to compete at a really high level. But we also know that college sports is a big business. Right now, uh, athletic director salaries, coaching salaries, administrator salaries continue to rise. The money is basically controlled by two sports, football and men's basketball, and it's controlled within five conferences, the so-called Power Five, which is the SEC, uh, ACC, Pac-12, Big 12, and Big 10. If you see the data up there, this came from the Knight Commission on Intercollegiate Athletics. From 2005 to 2015, the combined revenue of those five major conferences increased by 266%. Now, it's important to note that some athletes are seeing more benefits from colleges, uh, such as through uh, unlimited meals that athletic departments now provide, uh, from the Student Athlete Assistance Fund, and there's now additional value on the college scholarship through what's called uh, cost of attendance stipends. But we also know athletes have more value than what they're allowed to receive. 
Uh, it's why EA Sports publicly said that uh, if NCAA rules allowed it, they would let college players be able to uh, have their names in video games and pay them for it. Uh, it's why a Notre Dame women's basketball player, uh, thanks to a waiver from the NCAA, just appeared on Dancing with the Stars thanks to her newfound popularity uh, from sinking a couple game-winning shots at the Final Four. And it's also why we continue to see uh, year after year a lot of stories about football and basketball players getting paid under the table. So what if NCAA athletes could profit off their name? That's what we're going to talk about today. What, what would be the implications in a number of areas? Athlete compensation, educational achievement, competitive impact, NCAA governance, women's sports, high school and youth sports, and fan interests. After today's session, um, you will receive an email uh, with a survey that we hope you all will fill out. It's going to allow us to uh, take a deeper dive and get your insights, and it's going to be material that we will end up using um, to help shape the conversation for college sports leaders, athletes, and policymakers in the future. We hope today that you'll join the conversation on Twitter. You can follow us at, at Aspen in Sports, and you can use the hashtag uh, Aspen Sports Lab. Now I want you to introduce our first panelist. Uh, first panel can come on up to the stage now. Really pleased to have a really diverse group of, of people and, and people who are uh, knowledgeable on this topic and people who are within the, the world of college sports. Wasn't sure I was going to make that step. You, got, you made the step, John. <laughs> first, we have uh, John Thompson III. John is the uh, former Georgetown and Princeton basketball coach, and he was a member of the uh, the Commission on Basketball that uh, just came out with recommendations last week with Condoleezza Rice. Next to John is Dan Radakovich. Dan is the athletic director at Clemson University, and he is a uh, recent college football playoff selection committee member. And we also have Andy Schwartz. Andy is a sports economist and partner at OSKR, and he is the chief uh, strategist of the Historical Basketball League. Thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, I want to start with uh, quick questions, take about 30 seconds right down the line. We're going to start first with you, Andy. Um, what, what was your reaction to the Rice Commission you know, report that came out last week and the recommendations? Um, <clears throat> it struck me that there was a lot of asking other people to change their way of acting uh, and a doubling down on NCAA things. So NBA, NBPA, change, change the way that you've collectively bargained, and we're just going to enforce our penalties a lot more. Dan, what did you think? I thought they did a really good job, and uh, Coach, congratulations for being on that committee. I mean, it's a very complex question and a lot of issues around it, but trying to centralize those into four or five areas uh, where they can uh, look to have some substantive change, I think was very positive. John, you were on the commission. Did you, did you, did you feel you all did a good job? Did you, did you address everything you wanted to? No, we didn't address everything. You know, and I think we slowly started to turn the ship in the right direction. Um, you know, there's a lot that wasn't addressed. There's a lot that has to be hashed out even more. Um, you know, I think coming out of it, the understanding and the forming, the, the cohesiveness between the NCAA, the NBA, uh, the Players Association, with the understanding that, you know, what we're talking about here is a window from roughly 12 years old to, if you have a great NBA career, 33 years old. It's important that those entities work together instead of separate. So I don't think it was putting stuff off on other people, but understanding that the one and done rule, which is a players association rule, does affect the intercollegiate athletics. So you have to have that working together. And I think we've been moving in the right direction. So let me ask you about the elephant in the room. We'll start with Andy, just real quick down the line. The, the commission didn't address you know, NIL payments. Should college athletes be allowed to make money off their name? Right, so my answer is yes, but I always give the caveat that I don't even think that we, people out in the world, should be having the ability to say yes or no to that question. That, you know, the rights, we have rights as Americans and to abrogate them because they're college athletes seems wrong. You know, I don't believe so because I believe strongly in the collegiate model. Uh, amateurism and education are unique in, for the United, inside the United States as it relates to college activity. So, uh, no, those two things uh, right now, amateurism and education, are the bedrock for our model. John? You know, I think that it's time to start having these discussions. 
to figure out exactly what that would look like or if it would just be a free open market. Um, you know, I do think that once, as we go down this road, and, and not just this group, we're gonna go down that road. I think what gets lost in the narrative is the value of education. It's just too easy to say, well, scholarship, and then move on to the discussion. And I think we're teaching a segment of, of the youth that there is no value in your education. And I, think, I, don't, I don't think that is a good thing as we go forward, but I do think it's time to start figuring out how it should look. John, the, the commission cited the legal uncertainty as to yep. why not to address NILs right now uh, because the ongoing Kessler case, I assume, um, w if not for the legal, the, the legal issues right now, uncertainties, w was there enough support right now uh, on the panel to, uh, you know, to potentially do NIL payments? Uh, because of what's going on with our judicial system, we did not spend enough time for me to be able to answer that question. No. You know, I think the thought was, and, and I forget how, exactly how Dr. Rice worded it, but it's an issue that needs to be addressed. It needs to be looked at. The NCAA needs to alter the current model, I think was the feeling. But exactly what that can look like, we need to wait through until the Jenkins case and everything else gets hashed through first before you can actually go down that path. So let's do a hypothetical world. This is, we're, we're gonna hash this out you know, here today here. We're gonna have all the solutions. We'll figure it all out. Um, Dan, in, in a hypothetical world, the Olympic model exists and players can make money off their name, image, and likeness. As an athletic director, what is high on your radar about how this could impact your athletic department? Well, I think the, the Olympic model, you know, it, the way it is, it, you showed up on the screen there, uh, it doesn't marry into education. And I think that as long as we're a part of uh, the university system and the collegiate, uh, circumstance, you have to have that tether back and forth with education, whether there's an Olympic model to compensate student athletes or, or not. So I think we're, whenever those discussions occur, as Coach said here, there's a value to the education and there's a value that needs to be understood uh, and recognized as you, as you move forward. John, the, uh, the concern you often hear from people who say don't pay players and don't do the Olympic model is it's, the endorsements won't actually be what we see from the Olympics, people say. It's not gonna be the swimmer getting a legitimate Sprite endorsement, let's say, and it's gonna be boosters and alumni pulling together businesses and doing sort of a pay for play through endorsements. Is that what you think would end up happening? 100%. Now that's not to say that that's necessarily wrong, but if, if, you, if you go down that road, you, you, it's gonna be someone's job whether you whether institutions hire an outside person or someone who's already there to go out and solicit endorsement deals for players. I, I read where Tom McMillan, I believe he was speaking, in one of your articles he was speaking, said, well, we're, we're, we like this idea, and I hope I'm getting, I don't want to paraphrase him wrong, we like this idea of letting the athletes use their name, image, and likeness, but we don't want this to turn into a, a recruiting tool. It will. It will. And so I think if, if we go into this thinking that it won't, it's very Pollyanna-ish. Dan, would, would there be endorsement coordinators, for la lack of another word? I mean, if you hire every, everybody else in athletic departments. Sure. So is that what would occur? Well, I think that there would be certainly that opportunity within a, in a, within a program. If we did go down this path, you would have to be able to look to regulate it in some way, shape, or form. But you know, the thing that you worry about is right now there's, there's a lot of work and a lot of things happened over the last couple of years as it related to the balance that a student athlete has between their athletic endeavors and their academic endeavors, all the time management work that was done uh, over the last couple of years. By doing this, you would be injecting a third avenue, which would be their, their time to create their endorsements. And, and you worry about that because right now it's, it's very difficult for them to deal with the time issues that they have right now, uh, putting forward the opportunity to uh, you know, get endorsements. Uh, I don't know how many of the student athletes would actually be able to take, take that up on that, uh, but those would be uh, additional time opportunities that would need to, that could change that balance that the student athletes have with education and athletics. Andy, would this impact recruiting? And is, is that a bad thing if it does? Um, I think that you will see it, just like John said, used as a recruiting tool. What I think people miss, though, is that it's not likely to change outcomes in a, a substantive way. We're not going to see 
Ball State suddenly able to get football players that were going to Alabama because Ball State has all of this uh, endorsement money just waiting to get thrown at things. The, the talent goes where the schools are the willing to spend the most on a program. And to the extent to which that money gets shifted from boosters giving money to the school to boosters giving money directly to athletes, it's still the same sort of pool of demand. John, I mean, that, uh, it's a fair point. I mean, right now, there already is competitive imbalance. I mean, the, the same schools essentially um, most often make the Final Four, most often uh, win the national championship, most often uh, go to the college football playoff. Would, what would be different, you know, if, if athletes were making money off their name? I, I don't think that would change anything. I, I, I don't think other than the athletes would, would be able to make the money off of their name and likeness. But in terms of shifting uh, the hierarchy, I don't, I don't think that that will happen. I don't think that that will alter anything at all. Dan, would it, would it make a difference? I don't think it's, it's all the different changes that have happened in the NCAA over the last 25 years really haven't altered that uh, competitive uh, balance or imbalance for the way some people look at it. So I wouldn't believe this one, this would either. Andy, for, for better or for worse, there would be a, a difference um, uh, based on endorsement, endorsement payments, uh, based on locality. Um, so wouldn't there definitely be uh, more Alabama football players getting car commercials than, say, Vanderbilt uh, football players you know, in Nashville? And, and, and is there anything wrong with that, if there is that difference? I mean, I think you could probably look at locker rooms across the country, and uh, Clemson has fabulous facilities and other schools don't. And I think it will, it will mirror that. It's, it's this idea that, so economists always get, get teased for making predictions that come wrong. In 1956, the very first sports economics paper was about whether or not free agency in baseball would change competitive balance. And so now, what are we, 60 years later? And um, Simon Rottenberg, who wrote that paper, was completely right that the, the restrictions on earnings generally speaking, don't improve or hurt competitive balance. And so, yeah, Vander if Vanderbilt has less revenue generation capability, if, if the fans care less about Vanderbilt football so that the endorsement of a left tackle is not going to have quite the same oomph in, in Tennessee as an Alabama endorsement would, then yeah, they'll get less. But I don't think that's bad. I think it's just the same way that they get, they have slightly less pre prestigious coaches, they have slightly less fancy lockers. Right. For all of you, I mean, any one of you can jump in on this. When do you think these NIL payments would occur for players? Would it come uh, in the recruiting process, or would it come after they've shown some performance in college? Well, before, in, in the current Olympic model, how is it structured? So Katie Ledecky, when does mm -hmm. she get her money? Well, Katie Ledecky, actually, she got $115,000 um, for winning a bunch of Olympic medals, Olympic medals, and she's allowed to still compete in the NCAA, which is a whole other issue about what's the definition of amateur. But is it, is it put in a trust that she can't touch until her her, no. her no. eligibility is up? No. She, she can, can have it right, right, away. Sure. right away. Mike, Michael Phelps might be a better example because he chose to give up his amateurism. So he's like an example of what, what we're talking about would look like because it wouldn't be an impediment. He could do advertisements whenever he wanted. And then he received money for winning prizes as well. So I think there may be some window, like during the Olympics itself, uh, indoor, individual endorsements uh, can't compete against an Olympic sponsor. But outside of the Olympic weeks, they're free to do whatever they want. And, and the reason that Kitty Ledecky didn't do it before she won was because then she couldn't have taken an athletic scholarship at Stanford. And I think your question, John, was would it come in the recruiting process or right. later? And I think the Olympic model and Katie Ledecky that we're talking about here, she got her reward after performance. And I think that's, that is an important piece as well. But, Go ahead, John. but that will not happen. Um, I mean, for some people right. that come out of the blue and, and produce, yes, then it will happen. But I think what I said, my previous answer, it will become, good or bad, it's just a fact, it will become part of the recruiting process and that left tackle that's in high school right now will have the opportunity, and he knows walking in the door, that you're, you will be, this is on the table for you before you play one down football for school X because we want you to come here. Yeah. So you can imagine Zion Williams monetizing his YouTube account. It's got more views than, than a lot of uh, D1 colleges do in terms of, of how many people are watching what he's doing, and he's you know going to college next year. So um, that 
in a world in which commercializing one's name, image, and likeness doesn't mean you can't get a college scholarship, we'll for sure see people completely separate from the recruiting process commercializing their name, image, and likeness as, as teens in, in high school. But, but you were referring to right. part of the recruiting process. Right, right? Right, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. Saying, but you're talking about will that become part of the core fabric of an institution when you were recruiting a special athlete? And I think the presumption is it's just going to be for the Zion Williams of the world, like the, the Uber athletes. I mean, in, in this world that we're in, that left tackle that might be your third backup that's not really that good is going to have some endorsement yeah. deal offered no, to I agree. By some, I, some institution. Yeah. That's, that's not one of the, just going to be the elite of the elite. That's one of the reasons why I think that the, with the Rice Commission's em emphasis, and this is not meant disrespectfully, emphasis on the one and done guys. I went and looked, and during the prep to pro phase, there were never more than 10, I think there were only nine at the most, athletes who went directly from high school to the pros. But even just looking at the set of Adidas athletes who were named in the various indictments, it's more than that. And so the, the value proposition, oftentimes we hear, oh, well, you know, there's only only two rounds of the NBA draft, that's 60 athletes and half of them are from Europe. There's only 30 people worth anything. At the collegiate level, at the high school level, there is value that's far, far deeper than that. And, and I agree. So one of the things we haven't really answered here yet is, is like, who, who's going to commercialize the rights? I think we're all assuming that athletes would just do it themselves. They'd have the right to do it. But there's, there's certainly a model where if, if Clemson or Georgetown wants to recruit an athlete, they say, look, Here's what we think your, your rights are worth. We're going to go do it. We're going to make sure that you don't overextend yourself. We own the rights, and we're giving you an upfront payment, and we're going to give you 25% you know, of, the, of the, whatever the revenue that comes in from that. Right. Something like that. It would be a very different model. D Dan, I mean, do, do you think athletic departments would want to attach their name and their trademarks to group licensing with athletes? Because I could see a couple ways it goes. They say, one, it could be a new revenue source for them, you know, and, and, and uh, they may want to have some control over what uh, advertisements are used, what products they're endorsing. Um, but on the other hand, they could say, no, we really don't want to have any piece of this. You've got the ability to make your money off your name, image, and likeness, but you're on your own. You can't use our marks and our, and our name. I think there's, there's the differentiator there, whether they use your marks or not. Uh, certainly all colleges have licensing departments and they have sponsorship deals with certain advertisers. And one of the, the traps that would, would come forward with this is if your student athlete that's on your program is advertising a, a competitor uh, from one of your sponsors. So there's this confusion in the marketplace. So I think that you know, somewhere down the line, you know, there would have to be controls pulled together um, between the institution and the student athlete to be able to make sure that um, everyone's interests are aligned. You also would have athletes who have endorsements that may conflict with the athletic department endorsements. Right. You know, you have, you're a Nike school. You know, what if a Deshaun Watson, who's a great Clemson quarterback for you, won a national championship, He's in college and he says, I, I'm going to sign with Under Armour and I want to wear you know, Under Armour products. W what does that look like? Uh, that's a problem. Uh, I, I really <laughs> believe that because you know, there, there is that whole other end of the educational spectrum of this and the, and the scholarship and the coaching and the strength training and the uh, sports medicine that is, that is funded through a lot of those sponsorships. So if you were gonna run down this rocky road, you would need to have some type of, of uh, contract is probably the wrong word, but some kind of conditions with your student athletes to say, this is the areas that where uh, the university has that right with these types of, whether it's apparel, shoes, soft drinks, et cetera, this is, this is our domain here. Go, John. No, and, and I, I, I would agree and echo if we go down this rocky road. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it, you would have to, to carve out and pull separate categories that, that are non-negotiable. And so just to use an example, in the NBA, uh, Nike won the contract. Everyone wears Nike uniforms, Nike warm-ups, but they can wear whatever shoes that they want. And so there's still, you know, so you wouldn't have, you know, on the same team, we're on the same team, and you're wearing, hypothetically, an Under Armour uniform, I'm wearing a Nike uniform, you're wearing a Reebok uniform. And so there'll be certain, if you do this, certain categories that you would have to pull out and say, well, this, we hold these rights, you can go get everything else. 
Yeah. Andy, Andy, there are ways that pro sports leagues have figured this out, right? That's right. So, so Dan mentioned contracts. I think that's a great word for, for what you'd have. When you're out recruiting an athlete, you offer him a scholarship, which is effectively a contract now. And that, that offer would also include some negotiation over NIL rights in the pros. And, and as an example, as a plug, the, the Historical Basketball League, which is a league that we're forming, um, our goal is to say very much like the NBA, which is that the league owns the rights to a league-wide apparel deal. Every, every team in our league will wear whichever uh, apparel company sponsors us. Athletes will have the right to uh, choose their individual shoes, and that, that revenue that they go out and, and get generated is going to be shared something like 80% for the athletes and 20% for the league. Um, and the contract that athletes would, would solve in this hypothetical world or once we get launched is, is effectively a division of rights between these are the things that the school owns completely you don't get. These are the schools, the things that you own completely in the school other than say maybe uh, you know, uh, like a morals clause, like you can't go and endorse a alcohol or something like that. Go do what you want. And then there's this zone in the middle where we, we're sharing our assets. If you're in an ad and you, you want to use our, our logos, we have to get approval and we're going to split it by some percentage. And so that would be a dimension of competition, potentially. Maybe SEC schools share it 50-50. Maybe Pac-12 schools say, oh, well, you know, living on the West Coast is more fun, so you're 60-40. Right. <laughs> Andy, I want to get your thoughts on uh, potential legal implications. Um, the NCA and the conferences continue to go to court. You know, the Kessler case, the Ed O'Bannon case, they're all often getting dragged in there, uh, cost of attendance cases. Um, with the Olympic model, if that were to occur, how do they have to think through this so they don't get dragged into court again regarding the antitrust violations? Okay, so I have to be careful. I, I do work on, on Nigel's case. Uh, <laughs> so uh, if Jeff Kessler hears me say anything about that case, I'll get in trouble. Um, in general, the real problem with the NCAA is not any particular rule it makes, but the fact that it controls 100% of the market. There are 351 Division I schools, there are 130 FBS schools, and they are all commonly making agreements. So the simplest, easiest way to avoid antitrust problems is not to make a one-size-fits-all rule. And Dan Rasher and I, who wrote a paper in 2000 where we suggested if each conference made its own rule, you would have, depending on the sport, you know, you'd have a dozen competitive conferences that could balance off whatever, whatever needs there are for um, keeping a lid on things that people feel like, well, if this gets out of, out of hand, we can't have that. But at the same time, there's com competition. So if the, the Big Ten is too, too restrictive with its NIL rules, they'll start to lose talent to the Big 12 and things like that. So, um, the simplest way is not to have a blanket rule, but rather to say in units of one or 20 schools, go make some rules. Andy, you've never been on an NCA committee, have you? That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> that, I'm willing that, to learn, though. That's, that's a wonderful, wonderful idea, but gosh, it's, I mean, the NCA right now is, is, is grappling. Uh, we're all grappling with the transfer issue between our, our student athletes, and there are 800 student athletes in the sport of men's basketball that transfer each and every year, and that seems to be a, a, a real issue. They transfer, by the way, into the same system that they left, even though they're, they have the ability to leave at that point in time to go and, and play professionally, but they value um, the uh, collegiate experience. But my point in all that is that it is very difficult to move forward with these rules, and, and Coach has, has been in this business as well as I have. The, uh, the time spent on committees and moving forward with rules and understanding and consensus uh, is, is just quite different. And not because it, it's a problem with the individuals, it's a problem with ha having so many disparate opinions and, and people looking out for their, for their interests. Right, so this is like a classic argument for why socialism is bad and why capitalism is good is because capitalism doesn't need committees. <laughs> John, you were gonna say something? <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> um, I think that there is, in, in addressing or commenting on, on both of your comments, an understanding that how the NCAA goes about its business and makes those decisions needs to change and will change. Uh, and I think that's one of the things coming out of um, the, the commission headed by Dr. Rice. I mean, there's, there's an understanding 
that so much gets bogged down yeah. and lost. And that that has to change. You have to have an outside separate entity that can just make decisions so you aren't swirling for years and years and years trying to decide on the example you use uh, the, the transfer rules. And so, so, you know, that change is coming. And that's a valuable piece. And I think out of all the things that came out of the Rice Commission, that might be the most valuable. The idea of taking an issue, putting together in, inside folks from member schools, outside experts, people from very different backgrounds to attack a problem and bring those back to the uh, NCA and its membership, uh, I think is, is going to be one of the long-term benefits of what we've seen come out of the Rice Committee because it does, it, we do think it, there's going to be a much, much quicker appetite for change. Uh, let's talk also about women's sports. Um, Andy, um, you've, you've studied Title IX some. How should we think about Title IX implications if there's an Olympic model and, and the differences between if it's an individual endorsement or if it's uh, you know, group licensing with a university and a, and a pool of athletes? Sure, so, so Title IX is, is a little complex and people I think often think of it as saying something along the lines of, of if you pay a man a million dollars, you have to find some woman and pay her a million dollars too. And, and that's not, not the way it works. I'm gonna simplify it down just for this, which is that once you have your um, male-female athletic ratio, and I, I went and looked at Clemson's and it's something like 54% men and 46% uh, women participating in college sports then the financial assistance that you provide to athletes as a school has to be like plus or minus 1% of that um, to comply with the financial parts of Title IX. It's different from both the, the, the sexual assault parts, but also even the participation parts. This is just the, the financial piece. With the HBL, because we're planning to pay athletes maybe up to $100,000 a year, we wrote to the Department of Education and said to them, we're a third party, how is that going to affect the schools? And, the Department of Education kind of gave us an answer, which was like, you should assume that if you are working with a school that it's gonna, Title IX is gonna kick in. So we're budgeting for a proportional payment to women. This NIL regime would probably work the same way. It's maybe an open question whether if Nike gives a, a, a men's basketball player at a particular school a million dollar endorsement, whether that's too far away from the school to be seen as kicking in, but say it did, then almost certainly in this world we're talking about, the schools would say, wait a second, if you give him a million dollars, you're imposing something like a $900,000 cost on me that I'm gonna have to give to my women athletes. So as part of that contract that we talked about before, it says with the athlete, if you make a deal that has any Title IX implications, your sponsor has to agree to, to reimburse me. So either that means that the athlete only gets 600,000 and the school gets 400,000 to cover the Title IX piece or, or you know, there's a complimentary payment on the side. That's the sort of thing that, you know, Title IX is law and NCAA rules are just rules. And so the rules will have to adapt to the law, not vice versa. Maybe I'm unclear. In this hypothetical scenario that we're discussing, the athlete would go on their own with their agent and solicit outside endorsements, correct? They could do that, or the other way is they, they do group licensing uh, okay. with, with the university. Because if they do that, and I may be wrong, I'm not positive about Title IX law. If they do that, that's outside of the institution, and there will be no Title IX implications, I think. I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I'm not positive. I would have thought this too, except for when the Department of Education told us that our summer league job, that we're just, you know, we're just paying them to have a summer job, said, yeah, but because they're college athletes, they're, you should assume. So it, it would have to be tested. Um, it strikes me that, but I, I agree with you. As written, you would think that's, that's just, a, you know, that has nothing to do with the school. Dan, do you have any thoughts? How, how does Title IX factor in? Yeah, I'm not an attorney. Yeah. Uh, I'm certainly not a <laughs> Title IX expert. Um, but it, it, it seems to me that there is that, that there is a, uh, a, a correlation because they are, they're, they're college student athletes, and this is coming forward because of their collegiate experience and the fact that they're on a men's basketball team or a football team or a women's uh, softball team. So th there's going to be some Title IX um, implications. What those are, I really don't know. Now, for the group licensing piece, you can easily imagine that the school would have a group license, and the primary generator of the, the, like all, the whole team at once would come from football and, and men's and, and maybe women's basketball and maybe a couple other sports. Uh, softball is getting more popular, things like that. But 
almost certainly the wise thing to do there would be to have that group piece shared across all athletes because that's school money, right? And so it's no different than financial aid. Now, the thing is, is that Title IX is, is thrown out as a problem more than it's actually observed. If you go and look at schools, very few of them, even if they're doing a good job on the, the, the male-female ratio compared to, to their undergraduate thing, very few schools, if they, especially if they have football, meet the financial proportionality rules now. Nothing happens because the Department of Education doesn't enforce it. It requires somebody to complain. But I mean, like, you know, you could go through and probably out of the 130 FBS schools, I doubt, I doubt 50 of them comply. But you'd want to at least stay close as this world evolves. Right. John, I wanted to ask you also about uh, coaching. You know, so say you're a coach, uh, college basketball coach, and your players now are making outside money. Does that change anything for you as a coach, how, how you deal with them, how you coach them? Or you, would, would there be concerns as a coach about that? I'm not sure. Um, you know, I think that <laughs> we talk about the transfer, mm -hmm. the, the, yeah. the, the tr being able to transfer and play right away might affect coaching more so than if they're making outside income. I'm, um, I'm not sure how or if that would change. So in asking the question, how do you think it would possibly alter how someone does that? Well, you wonder, this is what you may hear from people who say you shouldn't pay players. Does it become harder dealing with some of the players? Are they, they have more allegiance to their sponsor as opposed to the team? Is it more difficult for them to juggle academics and sports and um, sponsorships you know, all, you know, all at once? Uh, would, the, would there be uh, different entities pulling at them? Well, I mean, Dan mentioned earlier, the, the, how much of a time commitment is this new pod going to take? How much is a time commitment? Are there endorsements? So that's something that's new. Everything else you're dealing with anyway. Right now you're dealing with are they more committed to themselves and to the team and are they listening to the person at the barbershop? And like, <laughs> so like that whole dynamic you're dealing happens, with right? already. Yeah. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think, and I may be wrong, that, that you know, adding... I mean, the pros deal with it now. If you're getting paid, you still have those guys still have to be coached. And so I don't know that that would affect how you go about the day-to-day -day coaching of your team. But in terms of the time constraints and the time limits, it actually it would could could be a factor there. Yeah. Uh, I also wanted to talk about youth sports and high school sports. I think this is another potential implication. Um, so, you know, the Aspen Institute Sports and Society Program, one of our big initiatives is Project Play, and we're reimagining youth sports uh, through the core values of health and inclusion. And one thing that we've seen when looking at youth sports is that uh, it's created a lot of commercialization of youth sports, that the, sort of the, the chase for the college scholarship. Uh, there's a lot more money that parents pay. Uh, there's a lot more demands. There's the specialization in one sport. And a lot of it turns out to be unhealthy. Uh, in a world where athletes can make this endorsement money in college. What kind of downstream impact do you all think that has on youth sports and high school sports? Does, does there become a, a chase for endorsements, so to speak? Well, I think, yes, that will happen. Um, because everything, you know, trickles down from the top. You know, you, you, you know, Allen Iverson braids his hair in an NBA game, hmm. and now everyone else, or not everyone, a lot of people start braiding their hair. Kobe puts on the sleeve, and every third person puts on the sleeve. And what happens at the NBA level, for the most part, will trickle down. And so you know, if you open up that door, will little Billy's mom and dad and little Billy's 14 years old start to, to think? Because they're thinking now at the youth age, hmm, how can I best prepare my child for this scholarship or this opportunity? And so that, that, that will eventually, I think, be, how I don't know, but that will eventually also become part of the equation. I think you would be creating, if we talk about little league parents and, and how difficult they could be uh, to their young people and with their young people's enjoyment of sport, uh, throw a dollar piece mm -hmm. into that. Uh, and I think it just, uh, it just creates incredible problems. Uh, coming down the path for those for those pe for those young people as they go on, not only with their high school career, but as they move into college and maybe for the rest of their life as well, that'd, that'd be very difficult. The other thing, though, is that there are some of these athletes, players, who do have a lot of value before they even enter college. Uh, and Andy, you were talking about Zion Williamson. I wanted to 
read the, the Instagram followers for some prominent high school basketball players right now. Zion Williamson, who's committed to Duke, has 1.5 million followers. Uh, Sharif O'Neal, he decommitted from Arizona, is at 1.1 million. Bowl Bowl is going to Oregon, 632,000. Mac McClung is going to Georgetown, 526,000. And according to influencer.co, these players could command anywhere from $90 to $1,400 per post on the, the one social media platform alone. Uh, so, I mean, Andy, what, what do you tell those athletes who, who have value before even entering college? You're being exploited. <laughs> Uh, um, I, I don't know. What do you mean? What do I tell them? Like why that? They well, can't why, do, why, why why they can't be allowed to to have a, a share of this money? Well, I mean, the economic answer is because the NCA is an economic cartel that gets together and fixes prices so that profits flow from athletes to great people like this on the stage and uh, to universities as a whole, and that um, to date the courts haven't seen fit to break up that cartel, but. Um, it's, I, I think it, it, in some sense, it stems from an idea that money is bad for some people, right? So like Dan's talking about like, oh, think about all these horrible parents and just if the, if the allure of money is out there, it'll make them all the worse. I think they're, if they're bad, they're bad. And I think if they're good, they're good. And, and I don't know if it's like this private organization of college's job to change how America parents. Um, I would say, though, that I mean, if, if you just do it, look at it as a rational point of view, if you think, like, parents make bad decisions now. They make bad decisions to spend a lot of money on a traveling team to try to get a scholarship, and it may not even be a profitable decision. Mm -hmm. To the extent to which the scholarship's more valuable, it tips the balance to being a slightly less irrational decision, or maybe even all the way to being a rational decision. Interesting. Uh, and he brought the cartel into it. Um, you know, yeah. Just an economic and, term. And listening to, to, to the, the numbers you read, I mean, I'm sitting there thinking, whew, I need to get my followers up. Yeah. <laughs> John, you have to join Twitter. We were going to promote you on Twitter. Right. We, you, you didn't know, have yeah. a Twitter but, handle. But part of this I'll goes you. To, to, to what I said uh, in my initial statement. Um, I, I think there's time to have this discussion to figure out what the future looks like. But I also think in a certain line of thinking, you're placing no value on education. So at Georgetown University, roughly, I uh, hope President Joy doesn't get mad at me if I get these numbers wrong. <laughs> um, you know, scholarship, full boat next year, $72,000. So over the course of four years, that's 290, three, 290 something like that. That's, that, that. that's real money. And so you are, you are getting, and that's why I say well, we're, we're, we're devaluing education and saying, well, that doesn't mean anything. You're not getting anything. You are, you are getting an education, and it's teaching kids, I think, to, to place no value on education at all when we say that means nothing. That means a lot. Now, that doesn't answer the question, could a select few get more doing this? Could, should we look at name, image, and likeness, which I think we should, which is why we're having this discourse here. But you can't just say that that 200, and my math is off, I think it's roughly right. 280, 290, means nothing, because they're getting that. That's, that's tangible, that's real, that means something. And, and that, that's just the tuition that is being paid to Georgetown. Correct. That's not the cost of the other benefits that they receive from conditioning to medical care to academic advising to uh, how they travel where they travel and all the other life experiences that go on to that so it does become it does have a multiplier effect for those student athletes so so just to be clear when i talk about exploitation i am not in any way saying that what the schools offer is zero at all i think that college educations are valuable and you can value them at something like four times the the cost of attendance um, because that's the market price. But, but exploitation in an economic sense is about the gap between one's market value and what one gets. So if somebody works at a job in a, in a one company town and they only make a dollar a day, like in the depression, and if there had been competition, they would have gotten $3 a day. They didn't get nothing, but they were exploited by $2. And it's the same, same sort of idea. And just to be clear, when I say cartel, nothing to do with drug cartels. Um, I wasn't sure. What you yeah. I thought it was oil. Yeah. It's, it's a, a, a cartel in economic term. terms simply means a group of independent companies that come together and agree on common pricing, like, for example, what a scholarship is. And, and you are correct. There are the special athletes that 
use that same example that 280, 290 on their own could possibly make more. Probably could make more. Okay? But is the value of the number 12 man on that team who's also getting that 290 worth the two? He's making out. Well, he's okay, here, here's the argu argument I would make. Why did you, when you were making offers, why did you give him a full scholarship if he wasn't worth it? Just, that's, that's, how the, that's how the system is. That's Except you could, you could have given them less. You, the partials, are, partials are allowed not, in college not sports. Not in a lot of sports, though. They are allowed. You just can't share them. So you could keep the money for the school and spend it someplace else. That would be a walk-on, not a scholarship student. No, no. You can give a person. There are MAC schools that give 50% scholarships in football because they, they don't want to give 100%. Not an NCAA Division I. Yes. I told you we would have this argument. <laughs> so hold on, you guys got together and talked and planned this. No, I said, I said to John, should we, should we explain? So there's, a, there's this thing called the counter rule. And the counter rule says that if you give somebody a do, in certain sports, if you give somebody a dollar of scholarship, you can't share that scholarship with somebody else. It doesn't mean you have to give them a full scholarship. But because athletes are worth it, they get it. And so you'll see at a few schools at the tail end of the, the value chain that athletes don't get full scholarships. Because they're not required, it's just that you can't share them. Whereas in equivalency sports, if you only give somebody a 50% scholarship, you can take that 50% and give it to another person. Yes. Let's, let's, let's move on. It's a little <laughs> bit in the weeds a little bit, I think, a little bit. But let, I want to open the floor to some questions uh, for Q&A. If you have a question, you know, raise your hand. We'll have microphones come down uh, to ask, uh, have you ask a question. And please identify uh, yourself as well. We'll go uh, right over here. Thank you. I'm with uh, Mike C. I'm with uh, George Mason University and a former journalist and now going into academia, doing research on college sports. Um, first, I want to emphasize that nobody has a license on some responsibility, right? In, in terms of uh, somebody being good or bad, you know, that depends on, we don't know, right? <laughs> so I want to say, having said that, the system that um, the soccer leagues in, in Britain used is being used in this country now in the amateur leagues and stuff. And I think that could be something maybe we could look at as a way to sort of, um, you know, get young people to go into what, you know, there are college players who are playing in the summer in those leagues. They don't get paid much, but at least it's guiding them in the right direction to become professionals. And so maybe something like that could be formed in, in the different sports. I know it's difficult for football, but, you know, in the different sports. I just want to share that. Great. Thank you. So other questions? Yep, in the back. Uh, oh, okay. over here, we got a question. Yep. Thanks for doing this. Uh, my name is Michael Pointer. I was a sports writer for more than 20 years, primarily at the Indianapolis Star, covered a lot of college sports, uh, now work in communications for a labor union here in town. Um, I just Before I ask my question, I want to put one thing to kind of put in perspective. The NCAA will fight anything that they feel like lessens their power. Mr. Schwartz is correct. It's an economic cartel. And anytime they feel like their power is threatened, they're going to fight it. Prime example is Title IX. It passed in 1972. They didn't recognize women's sports for another 10 years. And even after they did, they kept fighting and fighting full implementation of it. It wasn't until the early 2000s when uh, the Department of Civil Rights started threatening to take away money from the sc all the schools, not just athletic money, but academic money, that they got behind it. Now you're going to hear a lot of talk about them throwing themselves around Title IX for right, the reason they can't Michael, follow real, this. Real quick, so you, anyway, you just question? to put that in perspective, I, for all the panel, what is so threatening about a kid going out and making outside money or being able to transfer without penalty? These are things that all students have 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 the power to do if they're not in athletics. And Mr. Radovich, Radikovich, excuse me, said this is all about education. Well, those are things that you can do that are part of the educational process. My son's a normal student at Indiana University who works as an RA to pay for his education. But he can transfer and do whatever he wants on the outside. Why is that so threatening to you all, except for maybe Mr. Schwartz, to give these students the power to do that? John, do you have any thoughts on this? I mean, just the, the basic economic fairness question. So if, you, if you're a normal student, you can make money off your name, image, and likeness. Um, if, you're, if you're an athlete, there are a different set of rules. Yet we often hear that um, athletes should be integrated within the community. Um, but the other, there's a different set of rules. I think it's sort of uh, what he's getting at a little bit. Yeah, and, and, and as I said, 
in, ending the previous question, you said we're getting in the weeds a little bit. And I think as we go forward, we're going to have to get in the weeds. Sure. I mean, like I think that this, you, you can't progress just throwing up surface topics. And so that's where, you know, at the end of the day, we all may end up in the same place, but we have to hash it out and go through the weeds. To, to your question, and I'm going to be repetitive, um, when you say, r repeat the end part of that, uh, a normal, uh, a non-athlete can what? A, a non-athlete could go out and make money off their own value. You know, uh, uh, Natalie Portman, you know, was a, a movie star, and she made Star Wars while she was a, a college student. So what's to prevent a college athlete from being able to have some, they have some value. Why can't they? Yeah, and I, I think that's, as I said, that's why we're having this discussion. I think what gets lost in that is they are getting that $290,000. Mm -hmm. And so your, your son or daughter is working in, I forget where you said they're working. They're working. They are, they are, but they, these people are, and so that's a part of the equation. I also said that it's time for this discussion to figure we have to move forward. We can't get stuck. We can't get stuck in this is how it's always been, so this is how it should be. I think there's a realization that we are at that point in, with the NCAA, with the general public, with academia, with, 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 with the, the, the sports world in general, that we're at that point. Now, you can't just make statements. You have to go through the details. Right, right. That's exactly right. Yep, right here on the front. Andy, I have a question for you. All right. If the NCAA uh, AA is a cartel, economic cartel, why aren't they leading the charge to go um, to, to create, to take advantage of the financial opportunity that seems to be out there um, based on, you know, just JVing with these uh, super athletes? Sure. Where there's another, where there's a whole economic opportunity. Here. No, I think that's a really good question. So a couple things, these are facts that came out in public in court and during the O'Bannon case. So CLC, which is now called IMG College, it's a, a licensing group that focuses on college, figured that there was a, a billion dollars of lost individual name, image, and likeness or joint team individual name and likeness that was being left on the table. And this was in 2004 that on team stuff, the NFL and the NBA combined is about equal to what the NCAA does on team stuff. But on individual stuff, there was basically a billion dollars ahead. And even if you think, oh, well, individuals aren't worth as much in college, it's half, half of that. 500 million is a lot of money. So, so why leave that on the table? Um, well, I think that there, there are a couple reasons. And, and one is that while the pie might grow, having 100% sometimes feels better than, than having 67% of a bigger pie because of things, where is this going to go? There might be a recognition that it might even tip the other way. So I think there's a concern with the unknown. There is an element of indoctrination. So like, I never say the word student athlete, but it's very difficult to get someone who's worked within the NCAA to not say it. It's just, it, it's, it, they're trained to, even at press conferences, would you like to speak to the student athletes and things like that. And so um, there's a mindset, I think, that makes thinking like, gosh, we can make more money. Why don't we do this? Final thing though, Miles Brand, before he passed away, was trying to do this. He literally wanted to figure out a way to make more money. He just said, but we can't share it with the athletes. And the, the, the schools actually stopped him and said, look, if we go one step further on commercializing it, we'll end up having to share it. So they chose rather than, than share to just not go there. And a great example of that is the EA video game. Real fast, sorry. The EA video game. So, so literally after that case, the O'Bannon case settled on that piece of it, EA said, great. Now we can make the game. And the athletes were ready to make the game. And the NCAA said, you can't use our licenses if you're going to make the game. So they preferred that basically to take their ball and go home, uh, no one could play if it meant that they had to let everyone play. Real quick, we're going to have to wrap up. Um, we'll get to some more questions in the second panel. Uh, right down the line, I want to just get a quick uh, answer from you. If the Olympic model happens, we'll start with you, Andy. Who or what is the biggest winner? Who or what is the biggest loser? I think schools should be really careful about allowing the money to not go through them anymore. So if it's a true Olympic model where athletes can do their own deals, schools will be big losers, much bigger than they think. And so will, I think, potentially women. A world in which schools and, and, and athletes partner together will be one where Title IX is, is better enforced and where schools do better. Dan? I think that as we go down this, this road, this hypothetical road, I think there's opportunity for all enterprises to share in this and, and be able to come out better on the back end of it. John, your thoughts? Biggest winner, biggest loser? Uh, I haven't studied enough to be able to answer that and to totally understand um, is, is an honest answer. 
Um, I, I can see how women could, could, could lose out a lot. Um, but I think that it's important as we go down this road to understand that we have to hash out everything. And that in, in all of this, you know, does it, it, it shouldn't, if whatever world we end up being, that the academic component is still important. And so if you're yeah. making money off of your own likeness, that's great. But we still have these benchmarks and still the progress towards the degree and still the academic component is still important. And so as we have this discussion, it shouldn't alter that. Okay. Thank you very much. This was a great panel. Please give a round of applause for this first panel. Great Hold discussion. And, uh, we'll, we'll bring our quick transition and we're gonna bring our second panel up to the stage now. Go ahead, Andy. John, can I give you? Are we going to go back? Do we? Uh, do we? Do we? Great, we'll get started here with the second panel. Appreciate you all being here um, uh, on this panel as well. Let me introduce first to my, uh, your immediate right is uh, Bernadette McGlade. Bernadette is the Atlantic 10 Conference Commissioner. She's a former women's basketball coach at Georgia Tech. And I believe you're joining the Division I Men's Basketball Committee, is that right, in, yes. in the fall? Great. Uh, next to Bernadette is Nigel Hayes. Uh, Nigel just finished his rookie season in the NBA and also played in the, the G League, the Developmental League. He's a former uh, Wisconsin basketball star, and he's a plaintiff in the Jeffrey Kessler case uh, versus the NCA and the conferences over uh, athlete compensation. And then we also have Gabe Feldman. He is the, the uh, Tulane Sports Law Program Director and the Associate Provost for NCA Compliance. Uh, like we did with the first panel, we'll start with you, Gabe, and just want to go down the line in quick 30 seconds. Um, what did you think of the Rice Commission report and the recommendations? What, what did you make of it? Well, I think it's a good start. I think it's a good start to get that diverse group of people in the room. For those who were expecting fundamental shifts in the NCAA model and the relationship between student athletes and universities, they're no doubt disappointed. But there were some provocative and, and fairly bold suggestions in there. I'll just highlight one that hasn't really been talked about much, and that's that there should be more involvement and earlier involvement from agents, and that agents should have a closer relationship with student athletes. That is a shocking thing for anyone associated with college athletics or the NCAA to suggest. And if you had mentioned that 5, 10, 15, 50 years ago, that was almost the most taboo subject was the role of agents and the effort to get agents so far away from po as possible from student athletes. So I think that was a, an interesting, provocative suggestion that's going to require a lot more thought and for us to get into the weeds. But I, but I think overall the suggestions are in the right direction, um, but obviously not enough if you're looking to provide a lot more for student athletes. Nigel, what do you think of some of the recommendations? Um, I didn't directly read it. I was informed by you know yourself. Uh, I've been listening to the other three, listening to you, and um, the, one of the biggest things I guess left out was the NIL, and then I'm addressing paying uh, paying the athletes again. Like you said, everything's a start. Um, nothing will be perfect once you create it, but um, you know at least where are the NCAA is making you know uh, plans to try and make things better for all parties. Bernadette, what do you think? Um, actually, I thought that the report was very well done. Um, I thought the commission was a real powerhouse commission. I think there's a lot of credit to Mark Emeritt for um, uh, appointing the commission that was outside of the NCAA jurisdiction to give as much independence and transparency as possible. Um, I think that the commission was extremely diligent and very purposeful in exactly what they, they identified. And I think they were also very open with that this is not just uh, wave the wand and everything's going to be cured in intercollegiate athletics or with amateur athletics or the sport of basketball, but that um, it, it takes uh, truly a team to be able to really delve into all the issues that are being faced. It's a very complicated um, issue, and I think that the commission really opened up um, and provided for a lot of transparency and now we'll see the follow-up to the commission, which I think is going to be critically important that this report does not just sit on, on someone's desk, that now the membership takes ownership for the recommendations. 
to Nigel's point, NIL uh, wasn't addressed directly, you know, in terms of recommendations. Just real quick down the line, we'll start with Gabe again. Do you think college athletes should be allowed to make money off their name? Yes, and I start with the point of why shouldn't they be allowed, like every other individual in this country that has a right to their publicity, a right to their name, image, and likeness. There must be some compelling reason to not allow it. The compelling reasons that have been given in the past for the NCAA are to protect amateurism and to protect education. I think you can accomplish all of those at the same time. I think you can allow student athletes to profit off of their name, image, and likeness while protecting amateurism and protecting their education. Nigel, I assume you believe they should? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Bernadette, how about you? Where do you stand on it? Um, I think that the commission um, addressed it in a way, obviously um, identifying all the legal issues that are surrounding it right now, um, and that maybe this wasn't the exact time. But I think that we've heard unequivocally um, that there's an openness to be able to strategically look at uh, the possibilities of uh, what the use of name, image, and likeness for student athletes in an amateur setting, within intercollegiate, within higher education. Um, and that's a topic that's going to really need a lot of discussion and a lot of work. John, can I just note there's, there's an irony here. Um, the, the lawsuit that's pending that gave the commission pause in terms of giving a specific recommendation on name, image, and likeness, we keep referring to it as the Kessler litigation. That's a litigation brought on behalf of student athletes, one of them sitting right next to me, and we can't even give the student athletes credit for that lawsuit. We can't even call it the Jenkins litigation. <laughs> Jenkins. We refer to it by the lawyer's name. So it's that's fair, that's fair. As a reporter, I always wrote the Kessler case. I think more people were familiar with it that way. Martin Jenkins actually hasn't done many interviews. Not Nigel has done some interviews. Jeffrey oh, Kessler does interviews as well, but that's a fair point. I made one today. <laughs> uh, Gabe, um, you, you know, to Bernadette's point, you have thought through this question about NIL. You wrote a white paper um, in 2016 explaining one possible framework, one concept of what paying athletes for names, images, and likenesses would look like. You presented it to the Knight Commission and in Intercollegiate Athletics. Uh, talk us through a little bit what that concept would look like and what it would entail. Well, the concept is similar to the, the main point you laid out earlier, and it would allow for group licensing, it would allow for individual licensing, so you could do a deal as part of your university, as part of your team, as part of your conference with the entire NCAA, but you could also go out and do your own individual deal. You wouldn't be able to use the logos or the marks of the university unless they allowed you to do it, but you would have both opportunities. There would be strict regulations, both in terms of how much time you spent on it to keep in mind time management concerns, um, when you'd be able to do them, how much you'd be able to be compensated for to make sure that as best as we can, these are not abuses of a system, that you're actually being paid for your name, image, and likeness, and not so you attend the school, although I understand there's some overlap between the two. Um, there would be, have to be control over agents. You would need agent representation. Um, and I think this would all have to be centralized and vetted so that any third party who wanted to enter into an endorsement deal with a student athlete would have to be vetted by some centralized body that would say, we agree that you can have a relationship with our student athlete because we think you're a legitimate organization. We think you will have legitimate things for the student athlete to do, or you will use their name, image, and likeness in legitimate ways. And they can monitor how much compensation they're being paid. So this would be completely transparent. Um, but I think it would have to be centralized for the most part so we don't put too much burden on the individual institutions. Bernadette, uh, could Gabe's model work? What, what, what do you think about it in this hypothetical world if the Olympic model existed? Well, I'm not going to weigh in on whether or not it would work or not. I will weigh in. I think that your white paper was very well done. Um, I had the opportunity to uh, read the white paper. And I think, again, it is a, um, it's a document that um, provides for a, a tremendous amount of information, a tremendous amount of detail, and a possible roadmap if this were to uh, continue to get legs, so to speak, to be able to happen. So. Um, will it work? Can it work? I, I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball to answer that, but I think that it's worthy of discussion and of um, presentation and um, heavy consideration. Gabe, you wrote in the, the paper that uh, NIL agreements, if properly monitored and regulated, can enhance potentially and not detract from the educational experience. Can, can you explain what you mean a little bit by that? 
Well, sure. I mean, I think you can add an educational component to endorsement deals. And I get laughed at this a lot when I, when I say this, but if a requirement of doing an endorsement deal is you had to do a reflection paper or something that would get you academic credit, it could actually be used to help a student athlete who eventually become a professional who would probably have endorsement deals when they turn pro to understand what these deals are like, to give them some financial literacy, to better prepare them for the real world. And just like we allow externships and internships for, our, for all of our students, we provide an academic component where they're also doing real world skills but tying it into the educational model. So I think these can go hand in hand and enhance each other, not to mention that I think it could take a lot of pressure off of the student athlete in terms of financial needs. I think it could take a lot of pressure off of the NCAA that continues to get attacked and will continue to get attacked, I believe, legally as long as they continue to have rules that are more restrictive than necessary. I don't think restricting the ability of student athletes to profit off of their name, image, and likeness is necessary to do all the things they want to do. Gabe, are there any uh, legal concerns for the NCA with your motto, whether it comes to antitrust law, labor law, tax law? I mean, are you possibly creating a motto where there are antitrust risk and maybe they're, they're sending, going back right back into court again? Yes, there are risks. There are absolutely risks, but we're not operating in a world right now where there are no risks. I mean, the NCAA is getting sued every other month under whether it's labor law, antitrust law, you fill in the blank law. So they're in a minefield right now, and I think they're opening themselves up to attack because their system is so restrictive. I think if you make it a little less restrictive, then it eases up the attack and you make it better defend the overall system. Will it raise potential antitrust issues, labor issues, Title IX issues? Yes, yes. And Yes, but I think there are ways to try to modify the system to better protect it from those attacks and better defend it. But one thing we know about sports, and I think this is a theme that came out in the first panel, is that the courts treat sports like their own little special entity, whether it's the NCAA, whether it's baseball through their antitrust exemption, that people look at sports differently than they look at almost any other facet of society, and they often give it special treatment, which means that it's very difficult to predict how these cases will come out. So there's no guarantee that any system will be fully protected. Could it lead to some congressional exemption that would say, look, we're going to change our model, but we need to make sure that we are exempt, at least in some ways, from legal attack? Then maybe that's the solution. I think there are lots of different solutions. None are risk-free, but again, the status quo is certainly not risk-free. Nigel, you're one of those who are suing the NCA and the conferences. Um, you know, you're, you're in the Martin Jenkins lawsuit, not the Jeffrey Kessler case. Um, what, what caused you to file a lawsuit? And this came only after, I think it was your freshman season at Wisconsin. Um, yeah, it was introduced to me by one of my teammates at the time, Zach Bohannon. And he um, just saw me as a potential, uh, I like to use the term, athletic student. Um, as an <laughs> athletic student that, uh, you know, at the time, due to, uh, you know, the trajectory of me playing and, you know, generating a name for myself on the court and also being, um, you know, intelligent enough to be able to, to convey and speak on these ideas of why we need to be um, compensated for our efforts. And it's just something that I thought, you know, in the long term, if it doesn't help me immediately, it'll help, you know, a, a Nigel Hayes that'll come, you know, years down the road. So um, for me, it was kind of a no brainer to be able to do those things and make life a little bit easier for uh, the athletic students to come. College athletes typically don't um, put their foot in the water like that. They don't often take stands like this. Um, what kind of reaction did you get from the public and then from your teammates and coaches? Uh, from the public, it's, it's pretty much either you're against it or you're not against it. So, you know, now in the social media era, you have a lot of people who, um, you know, they have say they'll support you and then say that, you know, you're spoiled or you have enough with an education. Um, the teammates in the whole um, program, you know, they supported me and, had my back, uh, Bo, Coach, Coach Bo, he was on committees. He's always fighting for, you know, the rights for the for us as players to be able to, you know, be able to be compensated for everything. And, um, you know, again, it's just something I think is uh, is necessary, and I think that it's something that could be uh, implemented without, you know, that much difficulty. Again, I'm not as, uh, you know, intelligent on the laws and everything, again, like the other uh, panelists, but I just think it's something that it can be implemented and that would, um, whatever you do, you know, you can always start and grow it. I mean, even, you know, you can ask the panel of the room, everyone, maybe everyone would say they're proud to be an American. That's why we have amendments. They didn't even get it right at the beginning. So if they're allowed to change for the country, <laughs> I'm sure we can start with a little model and then we can amend it as we go because it won't be perfect from the beginning. So as long as we start somewhere, you know, we can always amend and make it better. 
when you were in college, uh, Wisconsin sold a, a T-shirt uh, in the university bookstore with, <laughs> with some famous words that you said at an NCAA tournament press conference. You know, they made famous with a, a stenographer, and you started, uh, I think, you know, having fun with some of the words. And they sold it at the at the bookstore, um, they, and they eventually pulled it. They um, did. They did, right? And, yeah, they did. And, um, what's that like when you see words that you spoke that you made popular? Crazy, right? It's it's being sold, and you're not getting the cut of it. Um. It was, uh, it was a little bit of both of like, wow, really? And it was like, it was kind of like, you know, a very pride, prideful moment. Um, but then it was just immediately like the reason they pulled it was, again, uh, the me not being paid for what I literally said. They put on a T-shirt. It wasn't even that cool. They just put words on a shirt and it was just selling. Um, uh, so it's, uh, I think that just shows, again, the, the difficulties that arise with not being able to uh, compensate athletes for what they do. I mean, I'm sure there are people who would have liked to have the shirt. I mean, I know that I spoke to people who are like, I got one of the shirts before they stopped selling them and they were happy about it. And, you know, I, I autographed the shirt. So I just think if we're allowed to do that, everyone benefits. You know, I receive whatever cut if that happens. The school generates because people are going to the bookstore. They may buy that shirt. They may buy something else while they're in the store. Um, the people are being, uh, you know, they're getting a, a sense of happiness and joy by getting the shirt. Because um, you know they may like what I do on the basketball court or like what I do off the court, so I think all parties win. Um, you know if the system is uh, implemented where we're allowed to be compensated. Did the shirt sell well? You know how it did? It showed so well they had to stop selling it. <laughs> no, I thought, no, no, no. I, th I thought they pulled it because they were concerned about the the appearance of athletes' names, images, and likenesses being used. Oh uh, yeah, what, that's what it I was read selling like hotcakes. Okay. You know people were lined <laughs> up. You know at like 4 a.m. to get those things. You know. <laughs> It was causing too much trouble on State Street, so they had to take them down. Uh, Bernadette, I want to talk about uh, competitive impact. We talked a little bit about it in the earlier panel. Um, you're a commissioner of a conference that doesn't have football, so you come from a little bit different position. You don't have uh, the money or the exposure or, candidly, the, the governance power that comes with football in the NCA. Uh, do, do you think that if the Olympic model occurred that um, there would be a difference in competitive impact uh, whether it's you know from schools in your conferences, your league compared to uh, you know those in the Power Five. Um, well, I would kind of agree with the first panel in that you know we've had changes in legislation and rules and permissible and uh, more permissible rules for 30, 40, 50 years, and and in sense in the big picture, the competitive balance really has not changed. Um, but I think in terms of how something like that would be implemented. Uh, would be critically important. And I do think that, you know, student athletes, when they're being recruited, they are looking at the institutions. They're looking at the overall support for the institutions, the, the academic um, curriculum of which where they're going, the um, geography, the location in a country, West Coast, East Coast, middle of the country. So I think there's a lot of facets. Um, I, I'm not so sure that any one stroke or one decision would change a competitive balance. Uh, for any other panelists, any of you think competitive impact makes a difference, Gabe? Again, I, it's it's hard to see how it would have a significant difference, and it just seems like with most of the rules, the rule only has to be enforced and, and the restriction only has to be in place if it's going to provide benefits beyond cost of attendance to the student athlete. So we don't worry about competitive balance when it comes to facilities and coaching salaries. And everything else, we might give a school a recruiting advantage. We even call them the Power Five. And we don't have a power. We don't, in other sports leagues, associations, we don't separate them out by how much power they have. We recognize their inherent benefits, advantages that certain schools have. Would this provide another advantage? Yes, but I don't think it's necessarily inconsistent with what's happening right now. I don't think it would have a meaningful difference. And I certain, certainly wouldn't disagree with what coach and our Clemson athletic director said if they would know better than I would in terms of it, and they said there wouldn't be any impact on competitive balance, so I'm not going to disagree with that conclusion. Bernadette, through the years, um, some university presidents, um, conference commissioners have said, if athletes are allowed to be paid, um, we're not playing that game. We're, we're going to pick up our ball and we're going to create our own set of rules that don't allow athletes to be paid. Do you think that's, in this hypothetical world, would that happen in the Olympic model? Would they say, would there be some conferences or some schools say, we just don't want to be part of this. We're going to create our own conference with our own set of rules? Um, I don't know if it would happen in reality, but I think that um, if a model of a pay-for-play were to come about, 
Um, you've got to really discern and take a hard look at the entire current model of which we work under, the amateur model, and you know the the scholarships and all of what goes with the scholarships. And you know, no one talks about the question. Well, that's fine. If we want to go into compensation for student athletes and pay for play, then do scholarships go away? And then the, the you basically pay as you go. So you pay for your tuition, and you can earn whatever it is you can earn. You can get your endorsements. But then do you pay your tuition bill, and you pay for your academic tutoring, and you pay for your um, study hall and your equipment and your food? And, and you know, again, if, you, if the whole system is, is undone, then I think the reality is that you have to address. Nigel, what do you think? Or Gabe, were you going to say no, something? Go ahead. No, go. Um, no I, don't, I don't think that you, know, you necessarily, as she was saying, you have to... Uh, to, to do away with all that, I think you know by uh, by being allowed to make money off of your you know your um, NIL, I think that helps college as a whole. I think it helps the uh, as people like to talk about the competitive imbalance um, by being able to accept money from different um, entities or different companies that want to you know sponsor you. As uh, Dan was talking about, so at Clemson they had a tremendous quarterback, won a national title, so. They have all this, you know, power. So, for instance, if it was a smaller school, if they took majority or some or most of their um, sponsorships, if we were allowed to make name or make money off our name, image, and likeness, and they say, you know what, you are a top ten recruit in the country, we'll give you this amount if you come here, as uh, you know, in accordance to with your scholarship. I think that would help because Clemson doesn't need to do that for that kid. They're like, we're Clemson. Do you want to come here or not? I don't need to give you extra to incentivize you to come. But if a smaller school does that, then that kid has something to think about. It's like, okay, I can make this much more while still getting my education. I can take care of my family if that's a need that I have. And I think that, you know, definitely shapes the, uh, the balance problem that we have because now you start to see more of these top highly recruited kids going to other schools. And then I think that definitely, uh, you know, helps that imbalance. And I would just add two other quick things. One is no one's arguing um, that you have to pay them or you have to get endorsement deals for them. It's just that you have to stop agreeing to not allow it to happen. And then they can make a decision on their own, whether it's an individual school or a conference or whatever um, group you wanted to, that they could decide, yes, we do want to allow this. No, we don't want to allow this. It's just the, at the NCAA level not allowing any of it. And the other is the, the question of if this system were loosened and so student athletes could be compensated either through a third party, which is what we're talking about here, or directly from the school, that they would take the ball and go home and they would drop out of Division I and just give up college athletics. And we heard some of those arguments when cost of attendance was an issue and that schools would have to pay up to full cost of attendance. And a lot of schools said, no, we wouldn't be able to do it. And if we were forced to do it or forced competitively to do it because our other the, our competitor schools were doing it, then we wouldn't be able to participate in Division I anymore. And that's not happened. Right? We've seen that these schools are continuing to play, continuing to participate. People still want to get in Division I, and they are most of them, many of them are paying full cost of attendance. So it's just a question of, um, how you find the money to do it, but that's the beauty and part of the name, image, and likeness model is the money's not coming directly from the schools, it's coming from a third party. Now, some might argue that third parties that would otherwise pay the schools are now paying the student athletes, and that may in fact be the case for some amount of money, but I don't think this is gonna be the significant budgetary burden that a true pay for performance system would be. Gabe, I'm curious, a couple years ago when you wrote this white paper for the Knight Commission, <clears throat> what kind of reaction did you get from people in college? Everybody sports? loved it, said it was the best thing they've ever read. <laughs> uh, I, I think there was, much like we're today, I, I think general agreement that this is a, a system that can work, and, and certainly I was not the first, and I'm not the last to suggest this type of system, and I think it's a system that fits with the collegiate model. I don't think it destroys the collegiate model. I think, again, it enhances the collegiate model. I think it takes into account most of the concern, the concerns the NCAA and people within the NCAA have stated. Um, I don't see a lot of reasons not to do it. I haven't heard any compelling reasons other than if we change the status quo, it will destroy the system. And I understand that fear. I don't downplay that people have those fears, but I just downplay whether those fears are actually legitimate. I think if you think about any significant changes made to sports, people say that change will destroy the sport, whether it's free agency in baseball. Baseball's done fine with free agency. The other one we're on the cusp of right now, 
for decades and decades and decades. People said the worst thing that could possibly happen in sports is if people gambled on sports. Next year, we may all be gambling on sports. Leagues are now embracing it. Something that was taboo one day becomes just a natural part of the system the next day, and I think this could be part of it. So I think more and more people are starting to recognize that, but this is not to suggest that there won't be obstacles, that there won't be difficulties, that there won't be a lot of problems to solve, but let's solve the problems. Let's not just say we can't do it because it's hard. So Bernadette, what would be some of the, the biggest challenges, do you think, for, for the Olympic model? What, what do you hear from schools about what, you know, what the obstacles would be? Well, again, I think continuing to tie the name, image, and likeness and tie it to the educational mission is, is really critically important in terms of degrees. And you know, one thing that I will say, what Gabe just mentioned, you know, the same thing happened when student athletes were allowed to work. All of a sudden, the rules change, and student athletes now they can student athletes can be on full scholarship. You can go get a job, you can earn extra money, and you can you know uh, do whatever you want. And and I might have a job that pays me a hundred dollars an hour. You might have a job that pays you two hundred and fifty dollars an hour. So and it didn't rock the world. It it didn't. And so I think that again, any time any type of a new model is introduced, in terms of you know, we often say the devil is in the details of how is it implemented. With the Olympic model, you've got the USOC, you know, the government, the USOC that's actually, you know, um, implementing that model. And, and the athletes can have separate endorsements. You know, the comment was made, uh, those endorsements, they can't do that during the period of the Olympic Games. They can do it before, they can do it after. And so you've got real fencing that goes around um, an overhaul of a, of a big decision like this that really would change the economic model. Nigel, we've talked a lot about the implications if college athletes could be paid, but we haven't talked much today about the implications if they're not paid. And by that I'm thinking of uh, increasingly in this activist uh, movement in our society, um, will players at some point rise up? I mean, do you think there will be a day where we see college athletes say, we're not taking the court, we're not taking the field, we're, we're gonna boycott this game over money? Uh, yes, I think so, especially with the more information that's being uh, already available in the social media era with the more research that's been done, more the bigger numbers as the number you read, a 266% increase in revenue. I think that uh, the players are realizing that, that obviously the NCAA is a business. Um, that's why they have TV deals. That's why they do all the things they do. That's why, you know, when I go into the NCAA tournament, I have to have a Powerade bottle and it has to be an NCAA cup, which has to be facing you. And they have to read the term, the student athlete, because it's all business, all things that they need to do. And all the money that's being made that the players aren't receiving, I think there's gonna be a point where, you know, the players um, don't play. And that's, you know, it's gonna take the, the right and right player, or it's gonna take the right team and, uh, you know, in the right big game setting when, uh, you know, the timing is right, you know, whether it's a, a national championship game whether it's just a league game that's um, nationally televised in prime time, I think uh, something's gonna happen and it will happen where players just go on strike, if you will, and boycott. Um, if you wanna get something done, boycott it. That's the best way to I mean, get do, anything done. Do players talk about it? Did you guys talk about it, consider it at Wisconsin? Uh, yeah, I actually had the idea my uh, senior year to uh, sit out and boycott the, uh, the Syracuse game, oh, wow. which for us is part of our Big 10 ACC challenge. And um, you know, the uh, I presented to the guys is, you know, we had our goals that year um, and it wouldn't impact any of the goals because um, it's a non-league game, which doesn't affect the league. It's not an NCAA tournament, so it's not we can lose that. And, uh, you know, it doesn't hurt our, uh, our record anyway because it's more like a forfeit type of thing than it is um, a loss. So it's something that I wanted to do. It was a nationally televised game on um, ESPN or ESPN2 at 8 or something like that. So um, it definitely caught a lot of attention, a lot of eyes. Um, my whole team wasn't on board with it, so you know I made a decision if obviously the whole team's not there that we wouldn't do it, but um, I'm sure that talk has happened in many other locker rooms, and I think that it will continue to happen until you know there's either um, one player or one team that finally has uh, had enough and is willing to make that change. I'm just curious, how many players did you have on board who were, who were willing to do it? Um, I start, we started off in our, our team group chat, and then you know guys answered, and you know, everyone was doing whatever they were doing during the day, but um, I told them if one of the guys said no, then we wouldn't do it. So one of our players said, you know, no, they didn't really want to do that. They didn't feel comfortable with it. And, uh, you know, of course, we're a team, we're family, we're brothers. So if one guy's uncomfortable with it, then, you know, we weren't going to go through with it. But I think it's something that 
if we did go through with it, we'd probably be having a very different conversation right now. Well, what, what was your message going to be? Because that's, that's always one of the interesting things, I think, if players were to ever boycott. You better understand what you're protesting, what you're actually fighting for. Do, had you thought that out of what that message would have been? Uh, yeah, it's just allowing us to, to generate that income on our, again, uh, the NIL that we say. Um, again, the Olympic model is one that is great, sounds uh, wonderful. Um, and I think any uh, athlete would be on board with it because it allows them to get paid. So it's one step um, closer to you know, the perfect utopia, you will, of the NCAA and the players. Um, but you know, my, our stance and my stance, the stance I have really is just to allow us to make that money and then get rid of the term impermissible benefit. So I think by getting rid of that term, um, it kind of washes the college's hands of having to deal with uh, Title IX is something that's talked about, or where do we get the money from to pay players if we're just allowed to receive benefits? And the examples I give is, you know, there's a, the nitty gritty, if you guys ever been to Madison, it's a, it's a restaurant on the corner. So if they would like to give me free dinners because they say you play really well, then I think it's something they should be allowed to do. That's not physical money, but is something that another player doesn't have to worry about because we've all heard about athletes saying they don't have enough money for food, they don't have enough money for this, that, et cetera. And um, I think by doing that, you don't have to worry about all of the, uh, the law type of issues that may uh, arise from implementing such systems. To be fair, there are now, you know, like unlimited meals, you know, athletic departments can provide, you know, additional uh, meals for athletes. Um, but Bernadette, when you, when you hear uh, Nigel talk about this, you know, boycott, it, is this something commissioners and schools are fearful of? Do you, do you all talk about this possibility? Um, well, we talk about all possibilities. We talk mm -hmm. about everything that affects our programs, our conferences, our leagues, our, our games, our events, our student athlete welfare issues. So everything is talked about and I would think behind every athletic director's discussion with their senior management team and conference commissioners uh, we talk about all of those things I think it's important though to recenter again we're talking about the collegiate model and there are choices out there you don't as a student athlete as a prep athlete you don't have to play in college um, you know if you are a premier athlete you can go straight into the NBA you can go into the D League you can you know, um, we have that opportunity as far as, um, you know, any of the um, professional opportunities. You see it in the Olympic sports all the time, whether it be tennis or golf or anything like that. So there are a lot of different models out there. Um, but, you know, once you are within an institution, and Nigel, the, I appreciate the fact that you talked about your team. And, you know, it, it never always is about one person. And you you often have... Everybody contributes something, and it might be something different that ends up in greatness, in championships, in winning, in success. And I think that that's all part of this model that we're talking about when we talk about the NCAA student athletes and teams. And, and again, I hate using the word compensation because the employer-employee relationship entirely changes the dynamic of the educational model of which we're dealing with right now. Gabe, I uh, wanted to talk some about women's sports and, and oh, Nigel, go ahead. What are you I was say? just going to, um, the, one of the points I was going to say is uh, you said there were other options, but, you know, I don't think that it's necessary to do those options. So, you know, can be honest with myself, I was not a, let's go from high school to the NBA caliber of player. I got better through college. And I think people complain now that they're tired of the one and dones because they don't like them leaving so early because they would like those players to stay. Um, the two primary sports, you know, foot, men's or football and then men's basketball are seen as entertainment. So it's not just college athletics anymore. It's like entertainment in society. We give our money to be entertained, to, to wind down and relax from things that go on. So these two sports are entertainment. That's why it generates so much money. So um, us being allowed to be paid, we shouldn't have to go to those other, you know, um, options that are out there because Again, we're going there, we're providing the service that we are, we're accepting the education that we're doing. Um, and again, as you say, you guys mentioned, you know, tying it into education, mm -hmm. I definitely agree with that. Um, also, you'll hear me say, I really don't think that's necessary. You can always go back to school. You know, so if you, whatever endeavors you do in life, if you don't succeed in basketball, you don't succeed in football, whatever you do, you always have the chance to go back and get your education. But I still agree with, you know, tying it into education. But um, I don't think we should have to worry about those other endeavors because if you take those kids that 
are really touted, as you guys mentioned, in high school, and you don't even bring them to the NCAA, then I think you'll hear even more people become upset because they enjoy college as that entertainment. So if they're already upset with one and dones, if you just start eliminating these marquee players and these teams, then I think you'll hear even more moans and groans to the point where they'll become, okay, maybe you should play because we really enjoy watching them play. We love March Madness. So if you take away this one and done, I'm going to be really upset all of March. So <laughs> There's always the next class. <laughs> Gabe, we talked a little bit earlier about uh, women's sports and Title IX. I wanted to get your perspective on this because because you've studied it some in relation to you know NILs. How should we think through that? You know whether it's athletes getting an individual endorsements or if there's you know group licensing. Well, I'd start by saying that it's this is a hard analysis because one thing we know about Title IX, at least when it was originally drafted, is they were certainly not thinking of this system at the time, and so we're trying to figure out how an old system would apply to a, a new type of model, but through the regulations and all the interpretations that have come since, I would find it difficult to believe that the Department of Education would say that Title IX applied to an individual deal that had no connection through the university. So if a student athlete were allowed to get an endorsement deal through Nike, that that would fall under Title IX. Just like we would say that outside employment wouldn't fall under Title IX. That if a person has a student athlete has, or an athlete student has a job um, with some local company, that doesn't get factored into Title IX. I will obviously defer to the Department of Education giving guidance that may be a little inconsistent with that, but I think it's, it's still an unsettled issue. It seems pretty clear if it's a group licensing deal that comes through the institution, through the university, then that would be covered by Title IX, and therefore we get into the, the financial prong of Title IX, and it'd have to be proportional to the number, the percentage of students, particip student athletes participating, athlete students participating, depending on their, their gender. So it could be the one of the best things to happen to women's sports is considering that the men would have most of the value, not all the value, I'm sure there are plenty of female student athletes who would have value in their name, image, and likeness, but if it's the star quarterback or the star men's basketball player who's getting the $100,000 deal, as Andy said earlier, you'd have to find another $100,000, not to give to one female student athlete, but to give, or roughly to the, to the um, female sports, or you have to divide that in half. If there's only $100,000 to give, 50 goes to, them, to the man, and then 50 would go to the women plus or minus what percentage of proportionality. Uh, but I don't think there's a clear answer as to, as to what Title IX would give in any of these. And, and it's, it, it may be that if we do fundamentally change the system, we need to fundamentally change the law to fit this. Because uh, as, as usual, the law is about 79 steps behind reality. And, and we're trying to put an old law into to new facts. So it might be that there's a there's a period of uncertainty, and Nigel put it best, we could have amendments, we could change these things. It doesn't have to be the first step is the final step. Um, but obviously Title IX is a consideration, but I don't think it's a, an obstacle, I think it's an opportunity. Bernadette, one thing I wonder is if, um, if women's athletes could get paid you know, outside endorsements. Does that uh, end up improving the profile of, of some women's sports? For instance, you know, we mentioned Katie Ledecky, uh, she recently turned pro, you know, after two years on the Stanford swim team. She was an Olympic gold medalist, and she turned pro in order to, to make endorsements. Uh, Missy Franklin, an Olympic swimmer, ended up leaving uh, early at Cal. Uh, I think Simone Biles, the uh, Olympic gold medalist gymnast, uh, wanted to go to UCLA but didn't because didn't feel like she could afford it, and so she, you know, she needed to get the endorsement money and turn pro right away. So could, could women's sports, could some of these non-revenue sports actually gain by having some of these high-profile Olympians stick around a little longer? Yeah, I think no doubt. I think certainly any high-profile athlete, you mentioned earlier about, um, you know, the Dancing with the Stars, um, NCAA waiver, and, you know, anything that brings more attention, more branding, more media of opportunity is certainly um, beneficial and helpful. I think your answer on the Title IX is probably pretty accurate, that there's not a clear definition of whether or not Title IX would kick in. However, if it was clearly a third party, you probably might not have Title IX issues. However, if the infrastructure of the athletic department, the college, the university, was built so that it was actually negotiating the group license, then I think you actually would have the obligation under Title IX. We showed a stat um, earlier on the, on the screen in the beginning about uh, that black Americans feel that 89% uh, of them believe college athletes should be paid for use over their name. Um, it was 60% whites. Uh, the Black Congressional Caucus has called on the NCA to change its, its operating model. Uh, Nigel, I mean, how does race shape this issue? 
Um, I think it's, um, I think race makes people uncomfortable, as it should, because it's something that needs to be addressed. And race uh, impacts, if not all, almost all facets of the way we do life. And the NCAA is no different. Uh, you said 89% of blacks? 89% of blacks okay. should be paid. Um, yeah. And I said it's entertainment. So when we turn on ESPN, we're not watching women's softball. We're not watching women's tennis, uh, women's rowing. We're not watching men's fencing. When we turn those things on to have ourselves entertained after you know a night at work, we're turning on men's basketball games or we're turning on football. And the majority of those players in those sports are black. And I think that... Um, you know, it, I see how the race comes into play by the NCAA not allowing those to be compensated is almost you can see it as we just don't want blacks to make money, which would have black families make money as you share that the money you generate off your name, image and likeness with your family. And then that helps the, uh, the economic inequalities of race in this country as well. So I see how that uh, can correlate with one another. And I think, again, uh, yes, that is something that that needs to be addressed because as we entertain ourselves with college sports, uh, we are watching the majority of black people playing these sports on television. So that's why you see the number of 89% and we know America isn't. Um, we're not all locked arms kumbaya yet. We know there's still racism and everything that impacts us. And I think you see that number in the disparity of 60% white versus almost 90% blacks. To, to Bernadette's point, um, you are getting access to, to education. You know, that you have the opportunity to, uh, to get a degree. I mean, how much do, do you value that? I mean, isn't that a, isn't that a significant uh, you know, uh, value? It is, but I don't think we should be limited to that. I mean, why limit ourselves? That's something that, again, the American dream to go forth and take everything you can. I mean, that's kind of how America was created. Um, so I don't see why we should stop with just education. We do value it. I graduated with Wisconsin, a uh, finance degree. Um, so it's education is something that I value, and I think it's something that we should all value, but that we shouldn't limit ourselves to that. I mean, if that's the case, I double and triple the money I was given by my college scholarship to Madison for my four years. So should I just make that back at the back end? Should we just keep a tally then and say, well, if you don't cancel out, then just take your scholarship and be happy you made more? Or for those athletes that generated revenue, like seeding that scholarship, do we then pay them off on the back end and say, well, thank you very much, you generated money because um, for me, I went to college and I met numerous kids who said, hey, I only came here because of you guys. So that's money coming into the university, that's money coming in to uh, that city, that community, that state, just because I was there playing basketball. Mm -hmm. So just multiply that by all the other kids and the money you get, you'll see that we're helping generate and create more money than just what my scholarship is worth. There's also a question about what is the actual educational opportunity that student athletes are getting, particularly in men's basketball and football, where we know the time demands. We know they're spending 40 plus hours per week in season, out of season, that we're counting. Um, and there's plenty of academic scandals that we talk about. And so when there's a discussion about, well, what do the student athletes get in return for playing, they get a meaningful education. They say, well, maybe not every instance they have. So what we will make sure is that they do get a meaningful education, full stop. That, that, how is that not implicit? I mean, how is that not what they should be, have been getting all along as a meaningful education? And then the question is, what can they get on top of that? But if they're not even getting a meaningful education, then, then what, are we, what are we even talking about? Because then you can't say it's all about education, it's all about edu education. We know it's not. No. We know it's not. And we know that student athletes can miss classes for competitions, but not vice versa. And we know that if you look at the Northwestern situation, Kane Coulter. <laughs> when, when you finish, I'm sorry for interrupting. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so just like it's not about education. That's what they say. So that way they don't have to pay us the same way the term student athlete was created to avoid workers' compensation clauses. So we're not student athletes, is what I say, athletic students. So I went to two Final Fours, and I think we left Monday to play a game Saturday, which means I missed a whole week of school which is okay, that's perfectly fine. But I had to write a letter and call the NCAA because I skipped class to do community service. That's illegal. Did you know that? I didn't know that. I did, so that just, I oversee our compliance office. Lame, so. <laughs> yeah. so I just think that shows right there, like I leave to go generate money for the NCAA in my school and that's fine, I missed a whole week of classes but I missed one class in a summer class. I had an A in the class, just for the record, um, to go do community service. And that's a you know, NCAA violation, which I was ineligible until I appealed and 
did everything I needed to do. So again, the NCAA isn't about education at all. This is something they have to harp on as long as they can until the system just breaks down and then you have to allow players to be compensated. But Bernadette, I mean, that, that, that is a real issue, right? I mean, that, that, that the amount of time demands, the travel that these players have. I mean, there's studies showing uh, some football, men's basketball players, when they're surveyed, say they're spending 40 to 50 hours a week, depending on what survey you look at, you know, on, on their sport, whether it's training or travel and competition and meetings. And I think that the NCAA and, again, the NCAA are all of the colleges and universities. We make up the NCAA. And I think that's where you can see the, the unbelievable funding that has gone on to, you know, the academic support, the tutors that travel with teams, the, you know, ability to be able to um, take your exams and to make your classes. And, you know, the college degree, your degree, and again, men's basketball student athletes across the country are graduating at a higher rate than the male undergraduate students at all the colleges and universities because of the advances in the NCAA rules and the APRs and the satisfactory progress. But that degree is going to, is paying dividends for the rest of your life, just like all of our degrees. I mean, you look at it hanging on your wall and it's, it's something that's going to pay dividends for the rest of your life. But you know, there's no getting around. And it's funny, you actually talk about the sport of football. Football student athletes probably miss the least amount of class time because of the way the football schedule, mm -hmm. you know, falls out. Basketball, both men's and women's, sports like golf miss a lot of classes. But I think that the academic and athletic, academic support systems are really trying to do yeoman's work and able to um, provide all of these support services. So that, in fact, the student athletes do graduate. I mean, uh, the NCAA does not take graduation and nor do the coaches and the, you know, all of the folks that are, are working in um, intercollegiate athletics. I mean, getting a degree and earning a degree is as important as the national championship. I think that, sorry to interrupt you. No. I think that that's just something you're supposed to do. Like if I'm, I want you to come to my school, I want you to play this sport, I want you to do well at this sport, I want you to win me championships, you should make it easier for me to be able to do the school along with the sport. So I don't think that's something that the NCAA should be applauded for. I think it's just something that it's a business decision that makes sense. How can I make you playing your sport easier on you? Well, I can give you a tutor. I can send a tutor with you. I can let you register for classes first so that way you get them because you need X number of credits in order to stay on course so you're not ineligible. You need whatever credits towards your major so that way you stay on track and you're not ineligible. So that stuff is just what they do. Right. Part to of the ensure process. their business thing. So I don't, I just think that further helps the cause for like why it's a business and why we should be uh, compensated or allowed to be compensated for the efforts that we do. Okay, we're run running low on our time and I want to open up the floor to some questions for Q&A. Um, if you've got a question, please raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone around and, and please identify yourself. Uh, in the back right there, Lisa. Uh, Davis Whitfield, this is for Nigel. Uh, what about an option? What if you were given an option to be able to sell your name, image, and likeness to provide your, your monetary supplementation for paying for school, paying for student services, paying for hospitalization or health care, et cetera, or you take the guaranteed money, so to speak, of a scholarship? What if you were given a choice? Would that satisfy the issue? Um, no, because I think it still plays in the part where we don't, we don't give choices in other aspects of life, again, our, in this um, in our economy with capitalism and the way we do, we don't do that to any other facets. We know that NCAA is a business. I'm an employee. I was an employee for that business. So we don't give people that option. We don't tell them, well, do you want this package of payment or do you want that package of payment? Just be happy whichever one you get. You take this based on performance. You get increases in this based on um, the accolades you have. You get increases. You get recommendations. You can change jobs and start working right away. You can make money doing other things outside of your job. So I don't think that that's something that should be offered. You shouldn't give me an, an ultimatum, either take this or take that. Not, not saying you were, but you know, you shouldn't, I shouldn't get a choice. I shouldn't have to choose which one. The scholarship should be offered. Um, and then on top of that, I should be able to receive whatever comes along with that. So I'm the 12th man on the bench and I don't get much, then I'm still happy I'm here. I got an education, I'm doing all this. If I'm the star on the team, I'm still getting my education. I graduated and I'm getting all of this for my hard work. So I just think it's something that should be allowed. We, we revere hard work in America. We always say, if you work harder, you get more. So if I'm working harder and I'm better than you, 
at this sport or whatever, then we should be you know, compensated for that. Yes. Any other questions? Uh, right here in the front. Hi, Jeff Prudhomme with the Interactivity Foundation. I just wonder how much of this whole issue, this problem relates to a fundamental unwillingness to recognize this is a market and we live in a market economy. And so all the little jumps and hurdles seem to be like trying to make water not flow downhill. Um, we, if we live in a capitalist society and people have economic value, why not let them make that value? We do that with coaches. Coaches are, you know, the market for them is quite good. So I just, I don't see the argument for trying to uphold a system that's fundamentally against our society's values. Bernadette, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, not really. I think that, you know, in all honesty, I mean, it, you do go with the market forces. You go with the market forces. And again, in the earlier panel, somebody asked about the question of a full scholarship. Well, you don't have to give the basketball player a full scholarship, but yet every coach that's recruiting every student athlete at the Division One level believes that they are worth a full scholarship. And that's part of their value that they're going to bring. And, and that student athlete is going to get value by the institution that they chose to attend. There's a symbiotic relationship between but everybody's getting value. Great student athletes are coming into a program. A program is funded well and has nationally ranked schedule and has a tradition of winning. And you put those forces together and then this legacy of winning and tradition continues. So, you know, I think, you know, that, that the market forces are going. I think even a lot of the changes in the NCAA are because of the market forces. You know, the additional cost of attendance, the additional meal plans that were mentioned, the additional enhanced travel, the ability for student athletes to work. These are all as a result of needs that have been defined and changes that have been made. There's also, speaking on behalf of the arguments the NCAA has often made in litigation and just more generally, going back to what I said earlier, that sports are different, that the rules that apply in other industries can apply in sports because sports need special treatment to exist. And what does that typically mean? One, that means they're needed for competitive balance to make sure not all the best players go to the best teams or best schools. We've already talked about how that argument has been de-emphasized in college sports and there's inherent competitive imbalance. So what we're really left with in college sports is this idea of amateurism, that these rules are necessary to protect amateurism. What is amateurism means? Well, amateurism is their definition of their product, and it differentiates it from pro sports. And the way that the NCAA has defined amateurism means that they are not compensated for their athletic ability, other than the ways that they are compensated for their athletic ability, including their scholarship, and then the other exceptions we make. But we draw a line, and that line has shifted over time, as John pointed out in his piece. Um, to the point where the Seventh Circuit has said recently, yes, student athletes are paid through their scholarship, but we don't consider that pay because if we considered it pay, then they would be paid, but they're not paid. Because if they were paid, they wouldn't be amateurs, and they are amateurs. And the Ninth Circuit has recognized that recently too, that even paying them a penny above their cost of attendance, anything untethered to their educational expenses, is a quantum leap from what we have now. It would destroy the difference between college sports and pro sports. And so that's why you can't let the market work, because if the market works, it will destroy the product. And then it will also destroy Nigel and every other student to come after him's incentive or ability to focus on education, because they'll just, I guess, be rolling around in their bed of money, and then they won't be yeah. able to open up their, their That's big bed, right? That's what it is, a big twin-size right. bed in college. Uh, we have time. Another question there in the back. I have so many comments, but I'm going to be really quick. Yeah, be brief, Nigel, please. I commend you. I've organized Thank seven you. different athletes. You are special, and I've been My around. My mother tells me that, that too. Special. <laughs> and Thank I you am very a mother, much. right? It. <laughs> okay. Um, I teach entrepreneurship at GW, and my student athletes uh, struggle with even launching a business because of the NCA restrictions, although right. they say it's Crazy. just a form. It's not just a form, and they can't even launch a business that has nothing to do with their performance on the field. Uh, Esports is coming. These athletes are paid. Nothing's been discussed about that. 
Um, the NCA is, is a business. You've mentioned it maybe 52 times. So why do they have unrelated business income? Why don't they have unrelated business income tax on the money they're earning as a business? And the last thing I can say about gambling is the NFL owners want to own the official stats. There's no reason why the players can't own their official stats and um, make money off of their stats with other gambling entities. And before I leave, um, Burnett, I can't say enough that as a teacher of 30 years, a tutor does not replace me. All right, appreciate it. Um, we're gonna wrap it up here real quick. Uh, I wanna do, as we did in the first panel, just go down the line real quick and assume that we do have this Olympic model. Uh, and the athletes can get paid off their names, images, and likenesses from outside parties. Who is the biggest winner and who is the biggest loser? Let's start with you, Gabe. I think the biggest winner are the athletes, the students who will be able to make money off of their name, image, and likeness like every other student on campus. I don't think there's a big loser. I think in the end, the NCAA wins as well because I think this better protects them against future litigation. So I think everyone wins. Nigel? I agree. Everyone wins. Everyone generates more revenue, more incomes coming in, more people share. A pie. The NCAA's issue is they just want a, uh, a you know, a, a, a nine-inch diameter round pie instead of a, a ninety-seven, eight-inch round pie, and take a smaller slice of it, which is still a pretty big piece. <laughs> Bernadette. Yeah, I would say that if the um, if the due diligence is done, I think it has to be a decision that everybody wins. I think we all know it's important to leave the negotiating table where everyone wins, and so student athletes, institutions, the NCAA. Everyone has to win. Great. Well, this was an incredible discussion. Please give a round of applause. Really appreciate this panel. Thank you very much. Um, to wrap up a couple things, first, uh, thank you again to Marilyn and Michael Glosserman for helping make this conversation possible. Thank you. Uh, thank you to our Aspen team, all our Aspen team that's here, and, and assisting Tom Ferry, who's the vision behind Future of Sports, uh, Marty Fox. Marty is our, raise your hand, Marty, a new colleague of ours, and he did a lot of tweeting today and helped with a lot of logistics. Uh, Andre Falden was telling me when to wrap up uh, with time, and also Emily Armstrong and Risa Sard in the back uh, helped with Q&A, so really appreciate it. Uh, one more thing, just be looking for in your inbox that we will be getting you a survey, and please fill it out and, and have uh, additional thoughts about this topic. Um, you can learn more about us, you see on the screen, sportsandsociety.org. You can see the replay of this at as.pn backslash college sports uh, future. Thank you all very much. Really appreciate you all being here. Thank you. Nice job. Thank you very much. Nice job. Thank you for